we're now going to turn and look at two types of financial leverage ratios. Financial leverage ratios, in contrast, look at both solvency and liquidity. Now, solvency ratios focus on a company's long-term financial health and its ability to meet long-term obligations, while liquidity ratios assess the company's short-term cash position and its ability to handle immediate financial needs and obligations. Both solvency and liquidity are really important considerations when evaluating a company's financial well-being. We're going to start by looking at the most common solvency ratios. Before we look at solvency ratios, however, I'd like you to think about what words come to mind when you think leverage. When we talk financial leverage, we're really talking about how much interest-bearing debt funding a business has relative to its equity funding. Financial leverage for a company can be, metaphorically at least, compared to something like a catapult. So just as a catapult allows you to launch a projectile much farther and with greater force than you could achieve by throwing it yourself, financial leverage empowers companies to propel their growth and profitability to new heights. Imagine that the company's own capital is the initial force you apply to load the catapult, while borrowed funds or debt act as the extra tension you add to the catapult's mechanism. When released strategically, the combination of resources enables the company to catapult itself ahead in terms of expansion, investment, and market presence. We say that financial leverage increases when a company takes on more debt financing relative to its equity financing. Another name for financial leverage you may come across is financial gearing. The terms financial gearing and financial leverage are often used interchangeably to refer to the practice of using borrowed funds or debt to finance a company's operations or investments. Both terms describe the concept of amplifying the company's returns and risks through the use of borrowed capital. Let's imagine a business that has assets of 75 and funds those assets with 50 in equity funding and 25 in debt funding. Comparing the amount of debt funding to equity funding, we can see that debt funding is 50% of the equity funding amount. Now let's imagine the company wants to increase its assets by 25 and doesn't want to ask shareholders for more money. Well, it could go to the bank and get more debt funding. So let's imagine just that. All the funding for the 25 in new assets comes from debt. This means our assets are now 100 and we have debt funding of 50 and equity funding of 50. Now the ratio of debt to equity funding has risen from 50% to 100%. We say that the company has increased its financial leverage or financial gearing. So why would a company choose debt over equity? Well, there are five reasons. First of all, the company may want to retain ownership control. And by relying more on debt financing, the company can raise funds without diluting the ownership stake of existing shareholders. Secondly, the cost of capital needs to be considered. Depending on prevailing interest rates and market conditions, debt finance typically is cheaper than equity funding. This is particularly true when a company has a very strong credit rating and can secure debt finance at favorable interest rates. Debt also offers flexibility. Debt financing allows a company to maintain flexibility in its capital structure, because unlike equity, debt typically has a defined repayment schedule, providing the company with a clearer timeline for repayment. This can be advantageous when managing cash flows and financial planning. There's also timing and availability to consider. Debt financing often is more readily available and quicker to secure compared to equity finance which often involves more extensive processes such as issuing shares, finding suitable investors, and so on. If the company requires immediate funds for operational needs or growth opportunities, debt finance is often a quicker option. And finally, debt has a tax advantage. Interest payments on debt are typically tax deductible, while dividends paid to equity shareholders are typically not. So by using debt finance, a company can benefit from the tax shield provided by the interest expense, resulting in reduced tax obligations and potentially higher after-tax profits. Let's talk about optimal financial leverage now, 
or what I like to call the leverage sweet spot. Optimal financial leverage for a company is that level of debt or borrowed funds that really strikes a balance between maximizing returns and minimizing financial risks. It's really about taking on the right amount of debt, not too little debt or not too much debt. It's the point at which the company is leveraging its capital structure to create the highest value. Now, determining this leverage sweet spot involves careful consideration of a number of factors, including, for example, the company's risk tolerance and its ability to handle debt obligations without compromising its financial stability and solvency. We also need to factor in industry and business characteristics because different industries have varying levels of inherent risk and stability. So understanding the specific dynamics of the industry in which the company operates is crucial in determining an appropriate level of leverage. We also need to factor in cash flows and profitability. We need to analyze those cash flows to ensure that the company has the capacity to not only service the debt, pay those interest payments, but also repay the debt. We also need to factor in growth opportunities. So we need to consider the company's growth opportunities, its investment plans, and even its capital requirements. Companies with significant growth opportunities may be willing to take on more leverage to finance expansion. We also, of course, need to think about interest rates and market conditions. We need to evaluate where interest rates are and the overall market so that we can consider the impact of the cost of borrowing and again, the company's ability to service debt. There are also shareholder expectations to consider. We need to understand these expectations, such as expectations for dividends or capital appreciation. The optimal leverage needs to align with the company's ability to meet these shareholder expectations. Ultimately, the optimal financial leverage or leverage sweet spot, as I like to call it, varies from company to company and industry to industry. And it requires a thorough analysis of these factors along with a comprehensive understanding of the company's goals, financial performance, and risk appetite. Striking the right balance is truly crucial to ensure sustainable growth and long-term success. There are several different ways that we can measure leverage. Here we see two ways where we compare total assets to equity and then we compare total liabilities to equity. Now, typically all leverage ratios are quoted as a multiple rather than as a percentage. So let's imagine, for example, we have the total asset to equity ratio and it comes out to 2.5 we would say the ratio is 2.5 times, and that times is typically marked by an X, equity. We don't say debt is 250% of equity. Now, generally, the smaller the number, the better, because as an analyst, we wanna make sure that a business hasn't taken on too much debt. But as I've already mentioned, when we talked about the leverage sweet spot, a company can have too little debt as well. It's useful to know what the industry standards are first before evaluating this ratio. Here we have two more ratios that are typically the most commonly used of all the leverage ratios I'm gonna take you through. The first ratio, the debt to equity ratio, is the most common leverage ratio. Here, instead of taking total liabilities, we only look at total interest-bearing liabilities. This allows us to precisely compare debt financing to equity financing. Now, the second ratio, which is debt to tangible net worth, is a very conservative ratio where we are comparing interest-bearing liabilities to total shareholders' equity, but we subtract intangible assets. You may be asking, why do we deduct intangibles? Well, the rationale for deducting intangible assets from equity to calculate tangible net worth is to provide a clearer picture of a company's financial strength and the tangible value of its assets. Intangible assets such as patents, trademarks, copyright, and goodwill are non-physical assets that really derive their value from legal rights rather than physical properties. Since these assets do not have often a readily ascertainable market value, or they actually can be difficult to sell or monetize, we typically exclude them when calculating tangible net worth. The tangible net worth ratio is often used by commercial bankers when they're evaluating a corporate borrower to get a very conservative view of leverage. Our final two leverage ratios compare debt to EBITDA. The first ratio, debt to EBITDA, takes interest-bearing debt and divides it by EBITDA. 
Now, the second ratio, net debt to EBITDA, is very similar, except that we make the assumption that cash can be used to pay off interest-bearing debt. The second ratio will always be lower than the debt to EBITDA ratio as long as the business has cash on hand. These ratios are used by investors and lenders. It helps them evaluate the company's ability to generate sufficient earnings, EBITDA, to cover its debt payments. A high debt to EBITDA ratio may indicate higher financial risk, while a lower ratio suggests lower risk and a better debt repayment capacity. These ratios are also very popular with M&A professionals who typically talk in EBITDA multiples when they're valuing a business. For more on EBITDA valuation multiples, I encourage you to do one of CFI's many valuation courses. Now we're gonna look at leverage ratios. Again, what we're gonna do is work down rather than across and then do fill right. The other thing we're gonna do is try not to leave this sheet unless we don't have the information already on the sheet. So let's work our way through. And we'll start, here we go. There's total assets. We know that's right near the top under return on assets. We also know equity is right at the top. We know there's equity. Let's keep just getting the equity. We know we have EBITDA. Let me find that row 29. We know we have EBITDA. We also know we have interest-bearing liabilities. Page up. And we're gonna do, we're gonna take it from row 62, total interest-bearing interest -bearing liabilities. And there's our interest-bearing liabilities. Then we have interest-bearing liabilities. We have cash minus cash. which is 9135, good. And then we are done other than we need to go get total liabilities from the financial statements. So control page up. Total liabilities is row 94. And then what we do is we control R. Here we have our multiples. I'm gonna just pick on one, and that's interest-bearing liabilities only to EBITDA. Generally, this is often used by commercial lenders or bankers in order to judge how much debt a company has relative to its EBITDA, it's kind of its cash flow, operating cash flow. Um, and as a rough rule of thumb, you can see that the number here for big retailer is anywhere from 1.7 to 3. Um, the amounts of debt a company can take on really depends on the sector. And if the company has assets, it can pledge as collateral, like property, plan, and equipment. We will benchmark this later in the course and look at some trends. But for now, if you figure you're comfortable doing this, skip mid-retailer and go right to small retailer. But if you'd like some extra practice with me, stay tuned. We'll do it again for mid-retailer. Now let's calculate the leverage ratios for mid-retailer. Again, the trick is we're gonna work down, then across, and we're gonna to try to link things to this sheet rather than bounce between sheets. Okay, so we're gonna start with total assets, which is right near the top for the return on assets ratio. And equity is at the very top, even above that, because it was the first ratio we calculated, return on equity. Now let me scroll down. You can see equity is used a few times, so let's just get equity. Uh, we know we have EBITDA. Let me scroll up a bit more. EBITDA, 4249. We need that a couple times. We have total interest-bearing liabilities three times. We know where that is. We did that when we calculated the effective interest rate. So that's row 62. I'm going to go link that here. And then this one is interest-bearing liabilities minus cash, and we calculated cash turnover and cash days, so cash to 7315. Good. The only thing we need to link is total liabilities. That's not on the sheet already, so I'm going to hit a plus sign, control page up. Let's find total liabilities. That's row 94. And we can then copy this across. 
And as I've already mentioned, we're going to benchmark and look at trends later. But just uh, we'll look. Let's look at one of them right now, and that's interest bearing uh, liabilities to EBITDA. Recall for the big retailer, it was between one point seven and three. Let's look here. Mid retailer is using a lot less leverage. It looks like than big retailer, but we'll explore that later on in the course. Okay, now it's your turn. Have a go with small retailer and see if you can get the right result. Bye for now.